Well, okay, ladies, I'm trying to do something different today, and you can tell how cockeyed I am by being on one side. I'm recording these notes, I mean, record, recording this lecture from school to see how it goes. Now, we're still on pre-med, which is the reproductive system, chapter eight in the textbook. And yesterday we went over the terms, all right, the vocabulary. And we started going over page one of the actual notes, all right? Okay, and um, Kenya, I'm sorry, baby, you said you didn't get the notes, but I'm going to re-send them to you when I get home. Now, yesterday when I mentioned about the diagram, this is the diagram I'm, re I'm referring to. It's this one right here in your textbook. It's on page 260, all right? And those are the numbers I'm referring to when I say, if I happen to say number one or whatever. Don't forget, these diagrams are on your test, all right? With a word bank, but on the test. All right, we're going to pick up on page two. Like we said yesterday, we finished up. We went over the organs of the reproductive system. Remember, okay, you have two ovaries, two fallopian tubes, one uterus and one vagina. And we went over the labia. If you want to see a picture of the labia, all right, hold on. I'm going to get it. It's right here on page 259, right here at the bottom of the page. It explains what the labia is, all right? Okay, all right, here we go. Uh, diagram on page 260. Number one on page 260 on the diagram are the o is an ovary. It's highlighted. An ovary. Inside each ovary, there are thousands and thousands of small sacs called ovarian follicles, okay? And they're also called graphian follicles, but ovarian follicles, all right? Uh, number three on the diagram, I'm skipping number two because it's a ligament that just holds the ovary in place. Number three, okay, now just think of this. This is the ovary. Inside the ovary are thousands of little sacs, and inside each sac is an egg. So you don't have just the ovary and the egg, you got the sac, all right? Okay, number three is the ovarian or graphian follicle. That's the sac. Each follicle contains one egg, which is an ovum. The egg or ovum has no power to move on its own. It can't go anywhere, all right? And it develops inside each follicle. As the follicle enlarges, it travels to the outside surface of the ovary, and once a month, one of them is going to get to the surface of the ovary and open up. It's going to burst. Then the egg will come out, okay? All right. This is also known as ovulation or rupture of the graphene follicle. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I get this screen a little bit better. This is not too swift. All right. Let's see. Here we go. There's the ovary. Inside each ovary is a sac, a follicle. Once a month, okay? Once a month, right over here it shows you. The follicle goes to the surface of the ovary, it ruptures, and the egg comes out. For a little bit, it's floating in the intestinal cavity or the abdominal cavity until it's picked up by the fallopian tubes, remember, which are not attached to the ovary, all right? But Remember that sac the egg was in? It's not going to go away yet. We still need it, all right? All right, so that's what we call rupture of the graphene follicle or ovulation. All right, number five on the diagram. Look, if you have your book, look at number five, and it's right here. It's that yellow circle with the red circle inside. We're talking about the yellow circle. Okay. The yellow circle is known as the corpus luteum. Now, corpus means body. Luteum means l yellow. So it's literally the yellow body, all right? And that is the, the um, old sac that used to have the egg in it, all right? Remember, we still need it. And my daughter found out the hard way, my oldest daughter. Kept trying and trying to get pregnant. She and her husband for like five years. She'd get pregnant, she'd lose it. Pregnant, lose it. This happened all the time. So finally the doctor did a blood test on her and discovered she had no progesterone. 
Now, where does progesterone come from? The graphene follicle, which she didn't have. So once they put her on progesterone for tablets, she was morning sickness. I've never seen anybody so happy to throw up, but she held the pregnancy. All right, number six on the diagram. Let me show you on this instead. It's easier to pick up. Are the fallopian tubes. You have two, one on each side. And again, they're not connected to the ovary is correct. All right, fallopian tubes are about five and a half inches long, not attached to the ovary. And this is where conception or fertilization takes place inside the fallopian tube. Now remember, the egg can't move at all by itself. I don't care how much fluid you put this egg in, it's not gonna travel on its own. So the fimbriae are like little finger-like projections that swim, sway by, and they will pick up the ovary. I mean, they'll pick up the egg. As the egg travels down the fallopian tube, the fallopian tube, each side of it is lined with these little bitty hairs called cilia. And that's what kind of moves the fallopian, I mean, move, I keep saying the fallopian, moves the egg along, all right? Because otherwise the egg's not going anywhere on its own. It's just like a sperm with no semen or no fluid. All right, so the fimbriae, those are the finger-like projections at the end of each fallopian tube, and they gently kind of brush up against the ovary to capture the egg once it's released. The egg now can take two to three days to travel in this fallopian tube, all right? It's in no rush. Egg is gonna take about two to three days to travel in the fallopian tube. If it is not fertilized by a sperm, it will just disintegrate and die and be flushed out with the next menstrual cycle. All right, the next organ we're gonna talk about is the uterus. Now, like I said, I'm holding this up versus the book. The book is kind of heavy and awkward. The uterus, it is a pear-shaped muscular organ, all right, about the size of a human fist. Now, there's three parts, and here we go. You have the fundus, which is the top part. You have the corpus, which is also known as the body or the middle section. And then you have the cervix, which is the neck or mouth portion. This right here is the vagina. This is the cervix, all right? See it right there on the notes. Okay, now, the uterus itself is muscle, 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 but it's lined with three very important layers. And the first layer is endometrium, and that's number 10 on the diagram on the book. Endometrium, there's three layers. There's endo, let me write them down to show you what I'm talking about. There's, oh, there's endo, there's myo, and peri. And all of these end with metrium. You have the endo, you have the endometrium, which is the innermost lining, myometrium, which is the thick muscle, and then the perineum, which goes around. So I can show you that on the diagram, okay? The linings go right around the uterus. The endo is on the very inside. Myo is the muscular layer. And then you have the perimetrium, which goes around. So the endometrium is the innermost layer. Flip the page to page three. Myometrium, and these are numbers um, 9, 10, and 11 on the diagram on page 260. The myometrium is the muscular layer. Peri, like we said, goes around the outside. What's highlighted next is cervix. Cervix is the neck or the mouth part of the uterus. All right, the breast, and this is diagram B in the textbook. It's on page 261, show you right there, okay? Page 261, diagram of the breast. The breasts are actually mammary glands, which means they produce and secrete milk. They are lactiferous or milk ducts, and notice how duct is spelled. The breasts contain lymph nodes, which help fight off infection. The mammary papilla, if you look at the note, the book on 261, the right diagram, 
261. Number five is the mammary papilla. That's the actual nipple. Number six is the areola, and that is the dark pigmented area around the nipple. Now, breast can also develop a type of tumor, just like the uterus can, fibroids, where it's just muscle that kind of grows in on itself. But if you feel any lump, and you should be doing a monthly breast exam, do it at the same time each month, all right? But if you feel anything, you get to your doctor. Don't wait and say, well, it may be this, or Miss O said it could be that. No, Miss O said go to the doctor. All right. Okay, guess what we're talking about next? I gotta show you this picture. I know you're gonna go, ugh, but I gotta show it to you. Because it's the lady that wrote this book. It's her daughter when she had a baby. And I just have to find it and show it to you because it's that good. We're talking about the placenta. All right. I gotta get, where's that picture? Come on, lady. Oh, we're getting close. Okay. Anyway, the placenta is very vascular, means it's very rich in blood supply, all right? And it's sometimes referred to as the afterbirth. I cannot believe I can't find it. Okay, hold on. All right, now this is, again, not part of the notes for the test, because all of this down here is about reproduction with being in labor and delivery. This is where I picked up this information, all right? Okay, um, the placenta is attached to the umbilical cord, which is the baby's lifeline, all right? And sometimes you'll hear them say that the cord got wrapped around the baby's neck. Well, that's the cord that they're referring to, all right? Okay, everything on this page is just FYI. You can read it for yourself. It's page number four. Now, I just want you to know that, remember we were talking about all the hormones that a woman produces? Estrogen, progesterone, uh, follicle-stimulating hormone, and all that good stuff? Well, there's another one, and it's called human chorionic gonadotropin. And what that is, is the only time that hormone is out or being produced is when a woman is pregnant. That's the hormone that's being looked for on a pregnancy test, and it's HCG. And that is what causes your morning sickness, all right? Here we go, I found it. Okay, it's on page 265. This is the placenta. This is the side that was attached to mama. The other side was attached to baby but it's the baby's lifeline, all right? So that's what I was trying to get across to you. I just wanted y'all to see it. Okay, now the baby is also in a sac, known as the amniotic sac, surrounded by amniotic fluid, or the water. That's what breaks when you go into labor. All right, we're gonna turn to page five now, and we're gonna start going into the male reproductive system. Now, the guy's reproductive system is in chapter nine in the book. And I'll tell you the diagram I'm talking about is on page 313, all right? 313, that's the diagram. So when you hear me refer to numbers, that's where the diagram's coming from. All right, Roman number one, we're gonna start right here and it's highlighted, the testes. The testes is the male gonad, that's the male sex gland, all right? It descends from the abdominal cavity into the scrotum when the baby is in embryo, remember? Two to eight weeks, okay. Sperm is the male sex cell or gamete. There is a head, if you look on page two, uh, 312, you'll be able to see the, what a sperm looks like. And there is a head to the sperm as well as a tail known as the flagellum. The flagellum is what gives sperm its ability to, to, to swim. During one ejaculation, there can be as many as 300 million spermatozoa or sperm. Now, these sperm, unlike the egg, the egg can't move. It's there, that's it. Sperm do have the ability to move, but they've got to be put in a fluid. Well, you're gonna soon discover, if you look on 313, a lot of these organs in the male reproductive system are there simply to provide semen. 
Semen is the fluid that sperm travel in, number one. And number two, they're packed with sugars because sperm need a lot of energy, all right? If sperm are gonna go uphill, they're gonna go against gravity, they're going this way. Then they have to travel this way. That's like, you know, running a marathon for a person. So they need a lot of sugars. And the besides, like I said yesterday, it's like a bus stop. The bus stops and more people get on. The sperm travel, more and more semen is available. Testosterone is the male hormone. It's responsible for the male secondary sexual characteristics, facial hair, pubic hair, deeper voice. As it stated earlier, the male is the one that determines the sex of the baby. But the male does not determine whether or not it's twins. Twins, if you have a lady that ovulates one egg and it's fertilized by one sperm and it splits one additional time, that's identical twins. They've got to be identical. They're from the same egg, same sperm. Everything's gonna be identical. If when the woman ovulates, she somehow ovulates with and releases two eggs, and each egg is, is fertilized, that's gonna be fraternal twins. They're twins, but identical twins are always gonna be the same sex. Fraternal twins, you can have two boys, two girls, girl and a boy, because it's like two separate pregnancies at one time. I did have a student, cross my heart, honest to goodness, she got pregnant by two different men at the same, within 24 hours. And one was a white baby, one was a black baby. And she brought the little boys to school. They were about five or six years old. I mean, you could tell, definitely tell that they were brothers, but she gave birth to them at the same time. Sometimes it just, God says, let it be this way, and it's gonna be that way, all right? Okay, on the diagram now, we're on page 313, here we go. Number one are the testes, and number one is bottom left on the diagram. Testes are the male gonads. Um, should a testicle fail to descend when a child is an embryo, it's known as anorchism. Now, if a testicle becomes inflamed as the person gets older, it's known, remember we had it as a vocabulary word, orchitis. The scrotum is the sac that houses the testicles outside and below the body temperature of 98.6 degrees. It's necessary for sperm to form. Remember, sperm can't form at a higher temperature. The perineum, now the perineum is number three on the diagram. It's on the top right, on the right side. Ladies and gentlemen both have a perineum and it's located in the same place. The perineum is located in the same area as males as for females. It's the tissue between the vagina in females or the scrotal sac in males and the anus, all right? So ladies, if you ever gave birth vaginally and the doctor said they had to make a little cut, what they did was an episiotomy and they made a little cut in your perineum so the baby head, baby's head would come out and shoulders and it wouldn't tear. This way, it was a little straight cut. The doctor can sew you back up. If you tear, it could be as zigzag and jagged as can be. That's not too healthy. All right, now we're gonna start with the things that get onto the bus with the sperm. Seminiferous tubules, all right? Seminiferous tubules are uh, number four on the diagram, bottom left. This is where the sperm are actually manufactured way down in the testicles, all right? When you hear U-L-E-S added to the end of any word, it means just a smaller, smaller, smaller version. This is tubule, so it'd be a smaller version of a tube. If you have venule, it'd be a smaller version of a vein, all right? So this is where we have the seminiferous tubule. The sperm are actually manufactured there. From there, they go to number five on the diagram, which is the epididymis. Number five is on the bottom right side, all right? Believe it or not, you see this epididymis, all of this coil tissue, all right? That's 16 
feet long. It's like your intestines. You got 22 feet of intestines in your little bitty abdomen. This is 16 feet long, all right? The epididymis, this is where the sperm are allowed to mature. This tube is all coiled up. Look at one of your appliances. If it's a straight cord, the cord is straight. You can see it hanging up like five feet. If it's a coiled cord, you can't tell how long it is, but if you stretched it out, it would be long. Same thing with the tubules. Anyway, we're going back, and the sperm are manufactured, and they're going to go to the epididymis. The ampulla is where the sperm can remain, and they're taken care of in this area for up to 42 days, all right? And they're taken care of by what? Guess what? A nurse cell. I don't want to say anything, but guys even need help with us back then, okay? That far. They have to have a nurse cell to make sure they get the nutrients that they need. And everything in the, in the growing environment is good for them. All right. Um, the vas deferens. Now, that is number six, all right? And the vas deferens is about two feet long. So you got a lot of stuff coiled up in there. It's about two foot long coiled tube. The purpose of this is to carry the sperm from the scrotum into the pelvic region of the male. This is the tube that is ligated or cut or severed for a vasectomy, which is the male version of sterilization. So when the guy has the vasectomy, they cut both sides on the right testicle and on the left testicle, all right? Okay, how we doing on time? We're getting a little close. Okay, number eight is the ejaculatory duct, and notice how duct is spelled. It is an opening leading to the urethra, okay, in the male. It's gonna lead to the urethra. The urethra in males is, this is the tube for both urine and semen. And semen is nothing more than the sperm with all the fluids that have been added to it so it can maneuver and move. That's what semen is, okay? The Bartholin's gland, um, the seminiferous tubules, the uh, Botharin glands, all of those secrete fluids along the sperm's way before it gets to the urethra to be ejaculated. The ejaculatory duct is the opening leading to the urethra, like we said. Now the urethra, in males, it's the tube for both urine and semen, but you can't get two for one. But the prostate gland, this also, look where it is, way up by the bladder. The, th these numbers kind of jump around on this diagram. They're not in any specific order. The prostate gland secretes a milky fluid as part of the semen that helps the sperm in their mobility or the ability to move. The penis is made up of erectile tissue, the same tissue that are in female breast nipples and the clitoris or clitoris, however you want to say it. The tissue is called corpus, which means body, spongiosum, spongy, all right? You ever seen these sponges you can buy and they're real flat and you take them home and you add water and they swell up? Same thing happens here. Sponge and a corpus spongiosum. It's a type of sponge like tissue that allows the penis to become engorged with blood and to become erect. Now, when that happens, there is a valve that closes off that prevents the flow of urine through the urethra. 13 is highlighted the glands penis. Now, most men don't have this. If you've been circumcised, you don't have it because what it is is the very, very tip of the penis that's covered by the foreskin. So if you've been circumcised. Now the prefuse is also known as foreskin. It's a fold of skin that goes over the end of the penis. This is where circumcision removes that, all right? And if the child is circumcised, it all depends on what the parents want. If the little boy is not circumcised, when they get older, you're gonna have to make sure they understand good hygiene okay and uh, you know a lot of kids it's a shame with the bullying that's going on in school nowadays but a lot of kids will get teased because they weren't circumcised 
and they find out in the locker room. So, you know, it's up to the parents. You decide what you want. All right, my loves, we're going to stop here. Tomorrow we're going to go over our worksheet. And um, uh, Kenya, I'm going to get those notes to you. All right, baby, take care. Bye-bye.